What is going on, Jet fans? Matt O'Leary back with another video, and it wouldn't be a random last day of January, aka Robert Sala's birthday, without uh, just a bombshell of a report from The Athletic talking about uh, the New York Jets organization uh, and just some things that went on during the the 2023 season between this organization, Aaron Rodgers, Woody Johnson, Robert Sala, Nathaniel Hackett, the offensive staff, and really so much more. We're going to break it all down. We're going to get into it, give you examples, give you clips from the story. But if you missed it last night on the Talking Jets panel, we announced our first ever in-person draft party. So if you are interested in coming out and hanging out with us, uh, we are live broadcasting from the main event in Farmingdale on Long Island. Tickets on sale now includes a open bar for the duration of the first round. Uh, buffet, uh, raffles, prizes. It's going to be a whole lot of fun. I'm really looking forward to it. And it's always a good time to meet a bunch of Jet fans. So make sure to get your tickets. Okay, so here we go. Let's hop into it. The Some context, the story from Zach Rosenblatt and Diana Rossini from The Athletic. Uh, they apparently talked to 30 different sources within the New York Jets and really before we even get into some of the quotes and stuff like that the the leaky building is so annoying with this team and I really don't want to hear that oh this is it never used to be this way Joe Douglas used to never let anything out come on in 2021 the whole world knew that Zach Wilson was going to be taken second overall for months for months and no it wasn't because of uh, one uh, pro day throw it was it was very well known, which is why I had such a strong reaction yesterday to there being a report that Talisi Fuaga is a favorite of Joe Douglas's and Daniel Jeremiah, who's good friends with Joe Douglas, mocked Fuaga to the New York Jets at pick number 10. So, like, what what, what, what are we doing here? I, I, I think sometimes... People just get these ideas in their head and they're like, no, no, they're not. They're not. It's not a leaky building. He's not a leaky guy. This team doesn't leak things when that's not necessarily the reality. So we're going to go through some of the biggest points from this article, some of the biggest things that they mentioned. We'll go in order. The first thing that is mentioned in this article is the changed expectations for this team. After the Aaron Rodgers injury, the goal changed from Super Bowl to seven wins, apparently. So um, that is what really frustrates me because I understand people who say, well, you know, if you lost your quarterback, you had a bunch of different old linemen and they got they still got the seven wins. And I hear that and I understand what you're saying. Totally. You're not going to get pushback from me on that, but they operated to me, and this is what I was saying all, all season before this report came out, they operated like they knew that their jobs were safe, both Joe Douglas and Robert Sala. And to me, that is really frustrating when you have a 13-year playoff drought, when it's year three for Robert Sala and it's year five for Joe Douglas, that they are just like, you know, ah, four plays in, you lost Rodgers, whatever happens the rest of the way, if we get to seven wins, that's great that they should have been more aggressive to try to, I don't know, improve off of their seven win season from the from the year prior. They went seven and ten in uh, 2022. They went out and obviously traded for Aaron Rodgers. But then the second Aaron Rodgers goes down, it's all right. Well, we're just going to repeat the 2022 season, which was really frustrating. But I, I hate that that's what seemingly the goal was because it was so it was so obvious to me that that that's all they were interested in is just saving face, treading water. Let's not even try. The season's over. That's the first start of the excuses. Then it gets into the Nathaniel Hackett stuff, which is just. Nathaniel Hackett is is not a very good offensive coordinator, unfortunately. Uh, apparently, he lacks attention to detail. That's how he was described by these sources. Uh, the this example really really gets me here. It gets me a little chapped. Where apparently Keith Carter asked Nathaniel Hackett to give Dwayne Brown some help when blocking Micah Parsons in Week Two. 
Never did. That was the last time we saw Dwayne Brown this year. Uh, was in that week two game. He looked absolutely horrible. Parsons had the game of his life, but for whatever reason, they did not really give Dwayne Brown that additional help. He was very, very, I don't know, stubborn. He like he had a plan and did not adjust, and that was something that I think I've been really critical of with Nathaniel Hackett. I think he's done that way too often. Is he gets these ideas in his head and says it's got to be his way. It's got to be his way, and I don't think that's the exact right way uh, to look at it. Robert Sala is supposedly looking to add to this offensive staff to make it more collaborative on play calls and essentially reduce Hackett's role. So Hackett's going to stay because he's buddies with Aaron Rodgers, which is something that we all knew, but they are looking to add to the offensive staff. We've seen a couple of changes. Tony Dews brought in uh, running back coach. You have a new uh, you have a new wide receiver coach. So they're making some minor changes. Again, two things that I've mentioned that I would like to do. I would change the offensive line coach. It doesn't appear that they are going to do that. Who knows? Maybe, you know, over the next couple of months that changes and there's a new offensive line coach coming in here. That's something that I would like to see them do. And I would like to bring see them bring in a senior offensive assistant that could really help and get things going because I just – I don't think Hackett on his own is is great, and they are just relying on Aaron Rodgers to come in here and be Aaron Rodgers, which he can do it. And you know we've seen him do really impressive things, you know, before. But there are some major flaws with this staff, and especially on the offensive side of the ball with Nathaniel Hackett. Back to some more Robert Sala excuses. He apparently was complaining or just venting about his bad luck with quarterbacks and comparing himself to to Vic Fangio, which I get it. Like his defense has held up his end of the bargain, but you are the head coach of the team. Like you are also in in charge of what this offense is. You can't just look and be like, hey, they got the 32nd offense and you know, behind closed doors apparently he was talking about the offensive line and Zach Wilson derailing this team and all things like that. But you you can't think like that. You can't think like that. You you have to stop with these excuses and just find a way. Good coaches find ways. For instance, look at the Steelers. Mike Tomlin got that team to the playoffs this year. They stunk. They had no business being a playoff team. What's the biggest difference between what the Jets are and the Steelers are? Steelers were starting Mason Rudolph in a playoff game. They don't have a lot of pieces on offense, right? They used a first-round pick on Najee Harris, and their other running back is better than him. And there's some you know, question marks in the wide receiver room. And, you know, they, they were very banged up, and they still found a way to make the playoffs. Why? Because they have a great coach who doesn't make excuses. And Robert Sala, my, one of my biggest things with him and my biggest gripes is when things go wrong – it's like he goes into a shell. You see it on the sideline. I love his energy when things are going well. He's animated. He's running around. But when things go bad, it's like he, he tightens up. He doesn't know what doesn't know what to do. And that's when the excuses come out. And something else that I wanted to get into here is <laughs> this is just fantastic. Woody Johnson, known for being active on Twitter and sharing those opinions with Salah couple red flags with Woody Johnson in this article and should not be surprising to anybody. Woody Johnson active on Twitter. Yes, that's very possible that an intern is tweeting things out from the Woody Johnson account. But if you think that Woody Johnson is either not scrolling on his account or some other burner, I have a bridge to sell you. This is this is a person who very much so cares about what the public thinks of him and his, and this team. He wants to have this positive thing around the Jets, but him meddling and getting involved and sharing those opinions with Robert Sala, like Woody Johnson, in his best interest, in Woody Johnson's best interest would be to step back and let the football people do the football things. The best owners spend money, which Woody Johnson's willing to do that. Credit to him for that. At least he's not cheap. Spend money and hire football, baseball, hockey, basketball, whatever sport you're in, hire somebody to oversee the 
in this case, football operations, Joe Douglas, and let him do his thing. There's another point in the article where they talked about the Jets going younger, right, and playing Jeremy Rucker more and Izzy Abenikanda and guys like that, Jason Brownlee, Xavier Gibson. And it talked about Woody Johnson, you know, giving it his stamp of approval. You don't, you should not need the owner's approval for roster decisions and personnel decisions. Robert Sala said in a press conference earlier this year that he talks to Woody Johnson every day and meets with Woody Johnson. Why is the owner meeting with the head coach every single day to go over game plan and shit like that? It doesn't make any sense. I'm begging Woody Johnson to please be less involved. Less. I'm I'm glad that when Woody came back, they got rid of that stupid triangle thing where you had the uh, GM and the coach reporting to the owner, and now it's coach, GM, owner. But you know what? It, you still got to be able to let these guys do their job. It's ridiculous. It is ridiculous. And that's the biggest takeaway from this is, yes, there's you know there's absolutely frustrating things. Not, not a lot of this is new information. Like, if you followed along, they all season long, they acted like they had a pass. Um, you know, we knew that Nathaniel Hackett wasn't very good at his job. We knew Robert Sala was making excuses. And we know Woody Johnson medals. Like, that. that's not the frustrating. It, it is frustrating, but that's not the main takeaway. The main takeaway is, they are an incredibly leaky building that makes excuses after excuses. That's the Jets' biggest problem. And it's not just the coaching staff. You notice in the article, the front office is very rarely brought up. Front office gets such a pass from everybody. It seems like it's absolutely ridiculous. And you know what? This probably, don't I don't know Rosenblatt and Rossini's sources, but you'd have to imagine a lot of them are coming from the front office trying to save face like, hey, no, it's not our fault. We're dealing with, you know, this crazy owner and this coach who is, you know, so uh, insecure behind the scenes and, you know, the uh, an incompetent Nathaniel Hackett. It's where, where's the blame in this article? There's no blame whatsoever facing towards the front office. The only thing they talk about is how Aaron Rodgers has such influence over the front office. That was the only thing that we got. But can this owner, GM, and head coach, just please start holding themselves accountable and stop with these leaks. I don't know what, like, I'm not coming on here and saying they got to fire, you know, whoever the leak is or, or whatever. Like, I don't know how you change that culture in the building. It starts with the top to me. I think it starts with a big ownership issue, but I, I just, the, you can't have this, you can't expect to have any sort of success when you run such a leaky operation. And it's been that way for a long time. It's been that way for a long time. This isn't something new. This isn't something that just came out when Aaron Rodgers came. It's been that way. It really always has. So anyway, Bombshell Report came out today. Didn't love what we saw or read. Really, really crappy, but I want to hear your thoughts on it. Sound off in the comments below what you thought about the story from The Athletic. Once again, I'm Matt O'Leary. I'll catch you next time.